It was a gloomy March 4th in 1933 as Franklin Delano Roosevelt prepared to take the oath of office. Banks across America were shuttered. We are at the end of our string, the departing president Hoover lamented. But Roosevelt kept his spirits up, attending church that morning before riding with Hoover past cheering crowds to the Capitol Rotunda. There Roosevelt awaited his cue, scribbling a first line for his speech, this is a day of consecration. Emerging coatless before a silent multitude, he swore the oath in a ringing voice. Then Roosevelt confronted the crisis, declaring this a time for truth and action to revive the stricken land. The people craved leadership, not fear itself. His plans were bold, government itself must put people to work, foreclosures and costs cut, currency secured, speculation curbed, trade revived. First fix the economy, then global affairs. The money changers had failed, now apply nobler values. Resources must aid all, not profit a few. If I read the temper of our people correctly, Roosevelt intoned, we now realize as we have never realized before our interdependence on each other. Sacrifice and discipline were needed, led by the White House. He hoped Congress would act, but if gridlock continued amid national emergency, the president requested emergency powers himself. The people had asked for vigorous action and discipline. In the spirit of the gift I take it. As Hoover left, Roosevelt beamed his legendary smile, riding off to parleys about the New Deal. It was very, very solemn, and a little terrifying, Eleanor Roosevelt told reporters at the White House. The vast crowd seemed ready to follow wherever led. The out cried for leadership. When FDR took office in March 1933, the country was in the depths of the Great Depression. Banks across the nation had closed their doors and the financial system was on the brink of collapse. Despite the gloom, FDR projected an air of hope and determination on Inauguration Day. After attending church, he rode to the capital with Hoover and took the oath of office before a huge crowd. In his first days in office, FDR worked feverishly with his team to stem the banking crisis. He declared a national banking holiday, summoned Congress for an emergency session, and pushed through the Emergency Banking Act to stabilize the system. His first fireside chat radio address explained the crisis and inspired public confidence. Buoyed by early successes, FDR pressed forward with ambitious plans for relief, recovery and reform. He sent a flurry of proposals to Congress during the legendary Hundred Days. Major bills passed included the Federal Emergency Relief Act providing funds for the jobless and hungry, the Agricultural Adjustment Act to boost farm income, the Civilian Conservation Corps to employ young men on conservation projects, the Tennessee Valley Authority to bring hydroelectric power and economic development to a struggling region, the Securities Act requiring disclosure of stock information to protect investors, the National Industrial Recovery Act promoting job creation through public works and industry regulation. The Homeowners Loan Act to stop foreclosures on homes and farms. FDR demonstrated remarkable leadership amid crisis. He embraced experimentation, conveyed optimism, connected with the people, and built a spirit of shared purpose. The programs of the Hundred Days marked a historic expansion of government's role in public welfare and economic affairs. While FDR faced critics on both left and right, his activist approach brought a sense of relief and renewal to many Americans during a pivotal time. FDR knew he had to act fast. His first priority was ending the banking crisis paralyzing the nation. Just days into his presidency, he declared a national bank holiday, temporarily shutting down the entire system. He summoned Congress for an emergency session and pushed through legislation to stabilize the banks. In his first fireside chat radio address, FDR explained the crisis and inspired public confidence with his calm and reassuring voice. Bolstered by these early successes, FDR pressed forward with ambitious plans for relief, recovery and reform. In a whirlwind first hundred days, he sent a torrent of proposals to Congress. Major bills passed included emergency relief for the jobless and hungry, farm aid to boost incomes, conservation jobs for young men protections for union organizing and regulation of the stock market. FDR's flurry of activity seemed to embody his campaign promise of bold, persistent experimentation. 
He admitted he was playing things by ear, trying new solutions and changing course when necessary. This flexibility let FDR tailor policies to fit fast-changing conditions. But two key influences shaped his vision behind the experimentation, the Democratic Party platform and his circle of advisors. True to his pledges, FDR pushed deficit spending on work relief while also working to balance the federal budget. He fulfilled promises to legalize beer and help farmers. But the diversity of his team enabled many competing views to reach FDR's ear. When Roosevelt took office as president in 1933, the country was in crisis. The Great Depression had millions unemployed and suffering. But Roosevelt wasted no time taking bold action through his 100 days legislative push. He stabilized banks, put people to work, and brought hope. Yet dangers brewed overseas that demanded attention too. Hitler had become Chancellor of Germany, crushing dissent and building a dictatorship. Japan swarmed towards China's Great War, threatening war. Roosevelt grappled with these foreign policy crises through personal diplomacy, meeting with world leaders but proceeding cautiously. His priority was domestic recovery. An international economic conference was planned for London, but Roosevelt focused on raising farm and industrial prices first, even getting power from Congress to hike tariffs. He believed global trade must come second to national recovery. Pressures pulled Roosevelt in opposite directions. Some urged cooperation abroad through lower tariffs, as democratic tradition dictated. But others wanted domestic focus. When the London conference convened, the US delegation was divided and confused. Roosevelt suddenly rejected the conference's monetary proposals as ignoring deeper economic troubles, appending things. Critiqued as nationalist, he felt vindicated as US policies showed stability. But Secretary of State Hull returned hung furious. Similarly fruitless was Roosevelt's disarmament outreach as that effort collapsed. And on war debts, he refused global dialogue. Recovery would be America's fight, but how? Roosevelt followed progressive reforms of Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt, and even socialists in some policies. He slashed budgets like Hoover urged. His foreign approach echoed 1920s nationalism. There was no consistency. But now the quarterback experimented boldly. When asked the philosophy behind the Tennessee Valley Authority, he laughed, people would love it regardless. Embodying this pragmatism was his National Industrial Recovery Act, the New Deal's cornerstone. With industry and wages collapsing, many wanted economic planning. Roosevelt feared rigid 30-hour work week bills from Congress. He slowly convened advisors offering proposals like business codes and public works. The act let industry set fair competition rules, if approved by Roosevelt, exempt from antitrust laws. Government licensing enforced compliance. Labor gained rate collective bargaining rights and wage hour code standards. Billions went to public works. After heated debate over regimenting business versus inflation, Roosevelt built a coalition just large enough with something for all. The act was a grand compromise with voluntary business self-government but federal oversight. Roosevelt watched his son graduate as Congress passed the bill, then set sail on a schooner, conferring with visitors on board. The people felt recovery taking hold. Roosevelt sailed through criticism as he led the ship of state through stormy waters towards calmer seas. When Roosevelt took office as president in 1933, yet dangers brewed overseas too. Hitler had become Chancellor of Germany, crushing dissent. Japan swarmed towards China's Great War, threatening war. Roosevelt dealt with these foreign threats through personal diplomacy, meeting leaders but proceeding cautiously. His priority was domestic recovery. He planned an economic conference in London, but it accomplished little. At home, FDR finessed his program through Congress with masterful leadership. He fully used his constitutional powers like the veto. His timing was excellent in outlining proposals, then pressing for action. The executive branch drafted key bills. FDR constantly pressed Congress, using patronage and persuasiveness, while appealing directly to the people for support. This domination of Congress concerned some like Harvard's E.P. Herring. 
Roosevelt seemed an astute politician dealing to powerful interests rather than a crusading reformer. His control relied on crisis psychology and favors that could shift. But most Americans, desperate for recovery, backed FDR's bold leadership. His first term saw sweeping reforms enacting his New Deal vision, leaving a landmark legacy and forging a new relationship between the presidency and Congress. The National Recovery Administration was the centerpiece of Roosevelt's New Deal programs during the early years. It was headed by General Hugh Johnson, a colorful character who looked like an old cavalry officer. His main task was to get businesses to agree to fair competition codes, which would be administered by industry groups and would set wages, prices, and work rules. The codes had the force of law once approved by the president. This was an unprecedented level of peacetime government control over the economy. Johnson zoomed around the country by plane, giving speeches and convincing businesses to sign up for the program. There was a tide of national enthusiasm, with the NRA eagle appearing everywhere as a symbol of recovery and unity. But Roosevelt complained that Johnson was not consulting him on decisions. And the agency took on too much, even trying to set rules for shoeshine workers. The NRA gave too much influence to the most vocal business and labor groups in writing the codes. Consumers were left out. By late 1933, there was growing criticism that the NRA allowed big interests to gain control and was not helping small businesses and marginalized workers. Roosevelt appointed a review board and Clarence Darrow reported problems with the codes. The NRA's powers were trimmed before the Supreme Court invalidated the agency. The Agricultural Adjustment Act had similar issues. It focused on helping large commercial farmers growing basic crops like wheat, cotton, and corn by paying them subsidies to limit production. Smaller farmers growing other crops got little help. Sharecroppers and migrant workers were left out. Checks enabled bigger farms to mechanize and reduce the need for laborious. Small farmers complained of being left behind. Roosevelt closely monitored economic data on prices, wages, and employment as the test of recovery. He was encouraged when figures initially improved in 1933, but then concerned when they dropped again that summer. He blamed speculators and foreigners for trying to keep the dollar strong. Professor Warren said buying gold would raise prices, but this idea did not really work when tried. New Deal employment and relief programs did help the situation. Hopkins quickly pushed hundreds of millions of dollars to the states and oversaw short-term job creation. Ike's was slow with the Public Works Administration but ultimately funded many infrastructure projects. Other agencies like the TVA also carried out development programs. The RFC, AAA, and others pumped money through the economy. So employment slowly improved in 1934, though Roosevelt admitted people still lacked jobs. His approach was to broker and compromise between interests rather than take an ideological stance. He favored spending for recovery, but also wanted balanced budgets. He supported trade, but not at any cost to American business. The New Deal provided temporary relief, but structural economic issues remained. With the NRA invalidated and the agricultural programs benefiting some farmers over others, the early New Deal effort showed the immense difficulties of managing the entire economy. Roosevelt admitted progress was uneven across regions and sectors. He asked for patience as the country headed slowly but surely in the right direction. But critics on both the left and right argued more fundamental changes were still needed for a full and equitable recovery. The president tried to be pragmatic and flexible, but struggled to develop consistent policies to satisfy all groups. His willingness to experiment, compromise and improvise meant that the New Deal lacked an overall theoretical basis. But Roosevelt saw himself as the leader of all the people, not just a single ideology. This brokerage approach maintained political unity behind his leadership during the crisis, even as deeper economic divisions remained below the surface. This was the path taken by great leaders like Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson in earlier eras. They built new majority coalitions in their parties, brought together different factions and interest groups into a new voting bloc. This gave them the political power to drive their agendas. But FDR took a different approach. He practiced what we might call the broker leadership. Rather than building a strong liberal coalition of farmers, 
the Boers and minorities he tried to mediate between industry, business and labour leaders. For example, look at the National Recovery Administration or NRA. This centerpiece New Deal agency let big business and big labour set industry codes and prices. It looked a bit like Mussolini's Italian corporate state. Powerful interest groups were fused with government. This broker approach had political benefits in the short term. It allowed FDR to break groups off one another and adjust his tactics freely. Take Pennsylvania in 1934. The Democrats nominated two hacks, Guffey and Earl, for Senate and Governor. Meanwhile Republican progressives led by Governor Pinchot wanted to ally with FDR. But he wouldn't unite with them against the Democratic machine. In the end, a disgusted Pinchot even backed the reactionary Republican Senator Reed rather than FDR's Democrats. So much for a new liberal coalition in Pennsylvania. Out West, FDR dealt with the fiery radical Upton Sinclair, who had unexpectedly won the Democratic primary for California governor. FDR charmed Sinclair when they met, hinting he backed Sinclair's production for youth plans. But then he hung Sinclair out to dry, refusing him public support, while Republicans savaged him. In Wisconsin, FDR also played both sides. He praised the progressive Senator LaFollette for supporting New Deal bills, but wouldn't back LaFollette against the Democratic candidate. In the end LaFollette won anyway, leaving state Democrats weak. Why did FDR take this slippery, short-term broker approach? Well, he was focused on immediate needs, restoring the economy and helping people in the here and now. Building a long-term liberal coalition didn't interest him. He even once said, I have had to work through many people whom I did not like or even trust. Hmm, so much for principles. This broker leadership brought some political gains. FDR was able to tailor his message differently in each state and avoid offending democratic machines. But it also meant missing the chance to realign things through a strong liberal coalition. This tension between short-term maneuvering and long-term vision lies at the heart of political leadership. FDR chose the flexible broker path. Whether that was wise or not, only time can tell. But it defined his early years in power during the Great Depression. But no coalition lasts forever. Cracks emerge on FDR's right and left flanks. Big business elites hate New Deal spending and unions. In 1934 they formed the American Liberty League with leaders like Al Smith and John Davis. They blast FDR as a class traitor ignoring rights of property and profit. FDR privately fumes at these wealthy critics. Yet he publicly dismisses them as impractical doctrinaires without solutions. His real anger bursts out when an advisor, O.W. Sprague, resigns and protests New Deal policies. FDR nearly sends an abusive letter but restrains himself. By late 1934, FDR's break with the plutocrat seems irreparable. He tells allies that conservatives want to sabotage him, even secretly backing a radical general strike. Musing over his inaugural speech, he now sees fear coming more from greedy business elites than labor rabble-rousers. The New Deal consensus is cracking up. Yet the left poses even more explosive threats. FDR must walk a tightrope between rival popular forces, hoping his flexible leadership can somehow hold everything together. The country is deep in the Great Depression, and people are desperate for leadership. Enter the fiery Huey Long, senator from Louisiana. Long helped get FDR elected, but now feels betrayed. FDR hasn't delivered the patronage jobs Long expected. Long confronts FDR at the White House, waving his straw hat for emphasis. FDR refuses to be bullied. After Long leaves in a half, FDR remains unruffled, smiling. This shows FDR's calm, flexible leadership style. Huey Long catches the public mood with his Share Our Wealth platform promising free education, income caps, and bonuses for veterans. He claims he'll be president by 1936. Two other figures tap into discontent, the Catholic priest Father Coughlin and Dr. Francis Townsend with his popular old age pension idea. FDR watches his rivals warily, but thinks they can't all lie in the same bed. He bides his time while covertly undermining them. With Huey Long, FDR gives jobs to Long's Louisiana enemies and investigates his finances. 
with Corflin, FDR works through Catholic leaders to isolate him. FDR refuses to engage his rivals directly. His advisors worry he is losing ground, but FDR believes trying to dominate the headlines would allow the new actors, Long and Corflin, to turn the eyes of the audience away. Better to have this free sideshow in 1935, not 1936. So in 1935 FDR outmaneuvers rivals through political jiu-jitsu while keeping his calm, optimistic leadership persona intact. The country must wait for FDR to unveil his new stimulation of United American action. For now, FDR watches, waits and works behind the scenes, playing the long game. A strike wave surges upward in 1933 to 1935. Amid this turmoil, FDR unwittingly midwives the rebirth of labor action. A little provision tucked in the NRA Act gives workers the right to organize. Labor leaders seize on this, trumpeting union membership as patriotic. As strikes multiply, FDR sets up the National Labor Board to mediate disputes. But it soon collapses, unable to tame the forces unleashed. Senator Widener sees the need for a permanent labor law with teeth. FDR, still focused on the NRA's partnership model, doesn't help. The bill faces stiff opposition. But FDR finally backs a compromise, creating a temporary labor board. His collective bargaining policy remains fuzzy and reactive. Meanwhile, feisty young union leaders emerge, challenging the AFL old guard. Impatient to organize industrial workers, they split off in 1935, forming the militant CIO under John L. Lewis. FDR watches from the sidelines, seeing the union's internal politics as humdrum. Lewis grasps the potential to realign economic and political power, but FDR still views labor as needy beneficiaries, not future political allies. The ultimate test is FDR's handling of Wagner's labor relations bill. This radical legislation would massively empower unions, but FDR long stays called to the bill, failing to grasp its significance. Only when Senate passage seems certain does FDR flip to support it. The Supreme Court's NRA ruling further prods him. More pragmatist than visionary, he backs the winning horse. With typical dexterity, FDR then pushes the bill through. It passes, cementing the new partnership between FDR and Labour but his late conversion reveals a missed opportunity to fully grasp Labour's rising power. In his January State of the Union speech, Roosevelt called for only a modest agenda. He aimed to improve and consolidate New Deal programs, not massively expand them. But soon his presidency was squeezed between Chamber of Commerce attacks on the right and progressive demands for bold leadership on the left. A huge work relief bill exposed FDR's struggles. He requested nearly $5 billion to put people to work, rejecting small doles, but also progressive calls for even more spending. The bill easily passed the House. But the Senate was a mess, with debates dragging on for months. Conservatives wanted cuts, while liberals and labor groups fought for higher wages. Mischievous Ole Senator Long stirred things up too. FDR had to compromise to get it passed. Other bills ran into similar trouble. Social security floundered between left and right. A veterans bonus bill passed Congress, daring a veto. By May, Roosevelt was hearing cries for firmer leadership from all sides. But he stuck to the middle way, still hoping to renew the NRA economic planning law. Then the Supreme Court knocked the legs out from under him, unanimously ruling the NRA unconstitutional. Roosevelt was silent for four tenths days. Finally, he gave a dramatic response, lashing the court not for being anti-labor, but for making collective national action impossible. He quoted telegrams from desperate small businessmen, not just workers. This was a dissent by a mediator thwarted. FDR said it wasn't a partisan issue, but a practical one. Then he let reporters quote his singer, the court's definition of interstate commerce belonged to the horse and buddy era. Soon the second hundred days began. Freed from his middle course by the court, Roosevelt threw himself into a legislative blitz. He bluntly told Congress which bills to pass. His team whipped votes late into the night while FDR worked the phones. Complaining legislators dragged their heels but acted in the end. 
quickly the Wagner labor relations act passed, promising workers the right to unionize. Social security became law. Banking, utilities and taxes were addressed too. FDR's earlier reluctance on taxes vanished as he requested inheritance and income taxes aimed squarely at the rich. Tired legislators complained of the pace as FDR left them behind to go watch the Harvard Yale boat race. To some, this burst of activity seemed an abrupt left turn, embracing progressive demands he previously ignored. But FDR was not radicalized by protests or aligning with Labour's cause. He was not exploiting public unrest. Instead, surviving elements of his broken middle course happened to lean left. On labor issues, he salvaged what he could. Working with Congress also pulled him left. With the middle path closed, FDR's remaining options harmonized smoothly with liberals in power on the hill. The result, almost by chance, positioned Roosevelt to the left and achieved even more than the first New Deal. So in the crisis of 1935, FDR chose not ideology but pragmatism. Events conspired to shift the playing field left and he moved with it. But his eyes saw not just left or right, but the whole field. And he was determined to keep the ball moving toward the great goal hovering always in his mind but fixed only vaguely, the goal of restoring American lives and livelihoods. The Supreme Court had been blocking key parts of Roosevelt's New Deal programs for months. Federal judges across the country had issued over 1,000 injunctions preventing the government from carrying out acts of Congress. The judges scorned the programs as a user patient of the power. By early 1936, a pile of appeals was awaiting Supreme Court action. The nine elderly justices seemed far above politics in their magnificent courtroom. But behind their masks burned strong views on policy issues. Most had been politicians before joining the court. There was a solid block of for very conservative justices on the right, committed to laissez-faire economics. On the left sat three liberal titans, Brandis, Stone and Cardozo. In the centre were Chief Justice Hughes and Justice Roberts. It was hard to predict where the court would land on New Deal cases. In early 1936, the court struck down the AAA farm program in US v Butler. Justice Roberts wrote the majority opinion, using a narrow interpretation of Congress's power to tax and spend. He feared an unchecked Congress would become a parliament of the whole people. Stone issued an angry dissent, arguing the court should not assume only it could preserve America's institutions. But with Hughes now aligned with the right, the four conservatives controlled the court. Roosevelt was ready to fight. He would let the court overreach before making his move. Over the next months, the court struck down more New Deal measures, like coal and municipal bankruptcy legislation. The final straw came in June when the court voided a New York minimum wage law, also hampering other states' efforts. Roosevelt said the court was creating a no-man's land where no government could act. With the election ahead, Roosevelt would not yet reveal his plan. But the court's actions forced bolder legislation from Congress to replace stuck programs. Roosevelt also let Congress take the lead on veterans' bonuses, recognizing their need to appease voters. The judicial demolition locked Roosevelt into a more progressive path. The court had aligned him squarely against the right. A great struggle was ahead between the president and the nine old men. For years, there was a growing bitterness against President Roosevelt from wealthy businessmen and conservatives. They criticized him harshly in private clubs and spread mean and fantastical stories about him. Roosevelt could laugh at his right-wing critics, but he was also confused and hurt by their anger. He had saved the capitalist system, so why were they so angry? He told a fable of a man who fell off a pier and nearly drowned, but was saved by a friend. Though grateful, years later the man berated his friend for losing his silk hat in the rescue. The mystery is that Roosevelt in many ways was a conservative himself. He believed in responsibility to the national interest over narrow group interests. He cared about connecting the past, present and future. He valued religion and personal property. He had gentlemanly manners and understood that stability requires some change. Yet businessmen declared war on him. Why? Partly because some New Deal policies were bothersome. But business profits were actually rising. The real reasons were ideological and psychological. 
Businessmen were stuck in the idea of laissez-faire that government should not interfere in economic affairs. They saw the New Deal as an attack on individual freedom. The Supreme Court backed this view. But the vehemence of the businessmen's revolt also came from feelings of deprivation and insecurity. Roosevelt had robbed them of their self-esteem. Business leaders who felt responsible for the economy now felt blamed for the depression. Men who saw themselves as models of virtue now felt attacked. Government was becoming more dominant. Roosevelt had exploded the myth that wealth equals virtue. This psychological wound explains the tortured protests from businessmen. Their anger seemed bitter and illogical, tempting Roosevelt to respond in kind. The harsh editorials especially angered him. In the end, conservatism was betrayed. The American right failed to follow the great British conservative tradition that balanced reform and stability. It focused too narrowly on property and status. This failure influenced both Roosevelt's leadership and the left's view of a new deal. Now FDR was a mighty popular fellow when he first took office, winning by a landslide in 32. But soon enough, the honeymoon ended. As he started rolling out government programs left and right to lift the country from the Great Depression, a vast bitterness began swelling up against him. Powerful big business types saw red, calling him a socialist or even communist for his big government ways. Why, the Fancy Pants Liberty League and other elite groups unleashed a storm of criticism on FDR's plans, attacking his ego and lust for power. Stories and rumors flew about his maniacal laughter in the White House, about him losing his marbles. But Roosevelt, he just laughed it off and kept on keeping on. He knew these attacks from the wealthy class were predictable. In fact, he was downright tickled when word got out about for Ritzy Fellas in a private Philadelphia club, sitting around the fire, railing against the New Deal. Only to then turn on their radio and hear the president himself on air, mocking their clubby criticism from their well-walled, library seats. Oh, how Roosevelt howled at that bit of irony. Yet the opposition kept growing. Even Al Smith, Roosevelt's old democratic ally, turned Judas. Smith slammed the New Deal as stirring up class warfare and stealing ideas straight from the socialist cookbook. Those gathered at the Liberty League rally, including business bigwigs like the DuPonts, they ate it up. Roosevelt, though, he didn't flinch. He wrote Al Smith off for abandoning the party. After all, back when Smith ran in 28, he called a kind of red-baiting a tactic used by the powerful when they wanted to block progress. And FDR supporters fired back at Smith too. Senator Robinson blasted him as the unhappy warrior who betrayed his party. But the response that really turned heads came from Norman Thomas, the socialist leader himself. Now Thomas, he insisted the New Deal was no socialist scheme at all. Why, Roosevelt even rejected ideas that would have let the government take over the banks and railroads. Thomas ticked off the New Deal plans one by one, relief for the bankers, modest social security, attempts to simply reform business and agriculture. He cried that if the Liberty League saw all that as socialism, then they were the ones who lacked a true understanding of economic philosophy. See, Thomas was desperate to keep socialist supporters from flocking to FDR's banner. But his analysis hit the nail on the head. Socialism means public ownership of business and land, and Roosevelt flat out rejected that. The New Deal aimed to reform capitalism, not destroy it. So in that crucial way, FDR was a conservative. The socialists saw that clear as day. Meanwhile, the Liberty League couldn't see past their fears to understand Roosevelt's middle-of-the-road path. Now eventually, even the communists came around to pat FDR on the head. After calling him a capitalist puppet, once Stalin sought a popular front against the fascists, the American communists did their own about-face. Whatever their reasons, they ended up backing this so-called champion of the working man. Roosevelt, though, he got a real kick out of this kind of radical support from the far left. Why, he expressed downright disbelief that anyone could view him as some kind of dangerous radical. He saw himself as a practical man, pursuing concrete projects, not some wild theorist or ideologue. And in that, I tell you, FDR had it right. It was the businessman attacking him who dealt in airy philosophies about eternal principles. Roosevelt was the one focused on actual solutions, dams, roads, hospitals, 
helping real folks. The press had it backwards with all their cartoons of him as the nutty professor following loony theories. No sir, it was the corporate class that couldn't or wouldn't address the actual problems at hand. Again and again, Roosevelt pressed them for practical answers. But men like the Harvard Dean or the New York real estate mogul, they could only respond with abstractions about the proper role of government. FDR though, he kept his eyes on the prize, real life people who needed help. What are we going to do with them? He'd ask about the suffering masses. Provide housing for the poor, put people to work, those were the tangible things Roosevelt cared about. Now FDR, he was a mighty popular fellow when he took office, winning in a landslide in 32. But when it came to foreign affairs, some might say he was fumbling around in the dark at times. You see, Roosevelt didn't have no general guiding principle or plan for making decisions overseas. He just sort of improvised from one situation to the next. One day he'd be leaning toward those old internationalist Democrats wanting the US to work with other countries. The next, he'd be channeling them economic nationalists in his New Deal team wanting to focus on affairs back home. He tacked back and forth between different policies like a sailboat on the high seas. Now one thorny issue was the World War I debts that foreign countries still owed us. Roosevelt didn't want to cancel them like some countries hoped, but he knew they couldn't pay in full either. He tried suggesting various schemes, but Congress wouldn't budge. So Roosevelt got stuck in neutral, pleasing no one. Disarmament efforts stumbled too. Roosevelt boldly called on nations to eliminate offensive weapons and such. But Germany and others were already gearing up for war. France was worried about German revenge. And isolationist senators back home saw red at FDR wanting to tie America's hands. So that Geneva conference went nowhere and an arms race took off in Europe. As for joining international organizations, Roosevelt again danced a cautious two-step. He said nice things about the League of Nations, had the US cooperate some. But join full out? No siree. He worried what isolationists might say. Now one foreign policy Roosevelt did pursue with vigor was trying to improve relations with Latin America. Under his good neighbor policy, he pulled Marines out of Haiti and Panama, eased tensions over Cuba, going the extra mile to show the US would no longer meddle down south. The other Americas were right skeptical at first. But FDR kept at it, sending Hull as a delegate to that Montevideo conference. By 1936, he could boast of real progress. In late 1934, a high-profile US Senate investigation headed by Senator Joe Nye was unfolding. The Nye Committee put arms manufacturers on trial, accusing them of unethical war profiteering and even promoting wars to boost weapons sales. The hearings captivated America and fueled public outrage. Arms makers were cast as villains while the concept of peace was glorified. With war tensions rising in Europe, isolationist sentiment surged in America, especially in the Midwest and West. Voters sent staunch isolationists like Senators Borah, Wheeler and Nye to Congress. President Roosevelt watched passively as the Nye hearings stoked isolationism. He joined in criticizing on sales, but did little to shape public opinion. In 1935, mandatory arms embargo legislation passed Congress nearly unanimously. Despite Roosevelt's misgivings, he signed it to avoid a fight that could jeopardize his domestic agenda. The law stripped him of discretion on weapon exports, just as dictators were rearming abroad. As Italy prepared to invade Ethiopia, Roosevelt and Secretary of State Hull saw the arms embargo as hurting Italy more, since it depended on imported weapons. They wanted to deter aggression, but refused British urging to act through the League of Nations, fearing backlash from isolationists. After Italy attacked Ethiopia in October 1935, Roosevelt hardened against Mussolini but would only condemn the invasion morally, not intervene. However, the Neutrality Act only embargoed arms. Roosevelt and Hull tried unsuccessfully to expand it to materials like oil and steel. With sanctions looming, Hull warned against aiding Italy but said he couldn't speak for Congress on wider embargoes. Britain feared America would seize Italy's oil market if the League embargoed oil. But Hull refused to guarantee Congress would act in concert with the League. So Britain cut a deal with France to give Italy Ethiopian land, hoping to end the war. 
The controversial plan backfired amid outrage. With the league divided and sanctions weak, Italy's brutal war dragged on. In 1936, Hale Silesie made a desperate plea from exile as Italy conquered Ethiopia. He warned that letting aggression go unchecked endangered not just Ethiopia, but collective security for all nations. As his allies failed to materialize, Silesie's words would prove tragically prophetic in the years ahead. In early 1936, FDR worried to allies that Europe's security was unraveling, with dictators aggressively rearming while democracies appeased. He warned Congress that nations seeking autocratic power had lost patience solving problems peacefully. Though FDR blasted aggression publicly, his neutrality policy was ambiguous, was it to avoid wars or deter them? He educated Americans on neither approach. At home, FDR and Ho tried getting Congress to allow discretion on arms embargoes, key to their strategy. But isolationists like Senators Borah and Johnson prevailed, extending rigid neutrality laws instead. With Americans retreating inward, dictators brandished swords abroad. In March, Hitler audaciously marched troops into the Rhineland's demilitarized zone, violating treaties. Though some generals opposed the gamble, France and Britain failed to act. Hitler offered non-aggression pacts, but still eyed Eastern Europe. The League of Nations condemned, but did not intervene. FDR and Hull watched gravely, but America stayed silent. In Asia, Japan escalated its conquests, annexing Jihou and other Chinese regions. Tokyo accelerated naval construction, shaking off arms treaties. Alarmingly, Japanese moderates were losing ground to aggressive militarists. When former Premier Saito was assassinated in 1936, it exposed explosive forces in Japan. Civil war erupted in Spain that summer when General Franco revolted against the elected government. As Italian and Nazi forces flooded in to support Franco's siege, FDR called it an unfortunate catastrophe, but proclaimed neutrality. Britain and France banned arms sales to Spain's government, while FDR imposed a moral embargo not required by law. The Axis brazenly fortified Franco, while Western democracies stood divided. In fall 1936, the Axis pact between Germany and Japan handled a unified strategic planning between them. Meanwhile, the West still floundered without leadership against rising threats. FDR faced isolationists blocking his moves at home and aggressors running amok aboard. Dangers were converging, options narrowing. It was becoming a dark hour for internationalists like FDR. With tensions escalating globally, FDR urged peace directly to Hitler and Mussolini in 1937. Stressing potential US trade, he probed about resolving grievances. But efforts at outreach met with chilling silence. FDR also saw London's and Paris's cooperation against aggression, but they were consumed by appeasement. In Asia, Japan's hawks perched for further conquests. When Japan invaded China that summer, FDR condemned the aggression and public opinion swung toward aiding China. But FDR hesitated at meaningful intervention, worried about shattering neutrality and provoking Japan or isolationists. As China pleaded for help against Japan's onslaught, FDR relented to selling some arms while pressing Tokyo. Yet Japan carved out vast swaths of China while the West watched in neutral impotence as one diplomat put it. The failed sanctions over Italy's Ethiopia invasion were repeating. Time kept running out for countermeasures as dictators forcefully reshaped the world order. In FDR's first term, he failed as a foreign policy leader. Rather than shape public opinion to support collective security, he drifted on isolationist tides. FDR hoped events abroad would educate Americans, but instead reinforced fears of entanglements. He never interpreted the need for joint action, even implying to Congress that neutrality meant no entanglements. His inaction allowed aggression to mount unchecked. The gap between FDR's public and private views was glaring. Privately an internationalist, he recognized economic roots of war and that democracies must unite against dictatorships. Publicly, he echoed isolationists in avoiding political affairs of other nations. FDR understood leadership's role in democracy, even criticizing leaders for endangering world peace. Yet he did not lead. FDR's reasons for this paralysis were several. His party was split on internationalism, with isolationists in key blocks he needed. 
Having fudged foreign policy in his campaign, he lacked a mandate to lead it. Domestic goals took priority in his first term, requiring isolationist support. Some even saw internationalism as a betrayal of progressivism. FDR's advisors also held opposing views. Figures like Hull, Howe and Margenthal favored engagement, while others like Hopkins, Hugh Johnson and Harold Ikes opposed it. The nationalism of FDR's economic policies reinforced divisions. After signing only a modest trade deal with Canada, FDR felt he had risked political life. Avoiding risks before 1936 re-election was paramount. So FDR drifted on a sea foreign crisis, refusing to steer against the isolationist winds. As Secretary Hull noted, FDR followed public opinion rather than leading it. Their passivity amid global disorders worried internationalists like Stinson. FDR's silence after security collapsed in Europe and Asia, his acquiescence to rigid neutrality laws, and failure to educate Americans amounted to failed leadership in Stinson's view. Even close aides recognized FDR's first-term leadership had fallen short. Speechwriter Rosenman and Abe McIntyre observed FDR following public opinion when he should have molded. it. Without countervailing leadership, freemongers and extremists gained ground while the democracies fragmented. The consequences of inertia became brutally clear after 1936. Having secured re-election, FDR initially continued caution on foreign policy, fearing conservative coalition backlash. But seeing fascism's relentless advance, he finally asserted leadership. FDR delivered a quarantine speech urging confronting aggressors before violence erupted. Isolationists erupted instead. FDR retreated, fearing he had gotten too far ahead of public opinion. The lesson proved leaders cannot sustain such advanced positions without educating people first. FDR had failed to build the necessary foundation. So congressional isolationists kept constricting FDR's maneuvering room. Yet FDR had not resolutely challenged them when possible earlier, or fully appealed to the people's ideals. Fellow Democrat Hull believed FDR had not used his talents fully to shape public views. Without staking out clear leadership, FDR had surrendered the foreign policy ground to extremists. The events kept forcing his hand. The consequences of FDR's earlier failure to lead were now clear. With dangers rising abroad and critics attacking at home, FDR faced narrowed options. Having drifted rather than steering a steady course, he now raced against time to awaken Americans while global storms closed in. As the first term ended, FDR seemed untouched by the global turmoil, still hearty with keen eyes. Other leaders were aging rapidly from the strains of power, but not Roosevelt. If they bent under burdens, he shouldered his with gusto. FDR loved being president and usually looked in command. Cheerily swinging through varied tasks, he dictated notes, splashed with photographers, showed off knickknacks, greeted delegations, related ancestral tales over lunch, signed bills distributing pens like prizes, conferred on policies, parried reporters with jokes. The jarred facets called for many roles, and FDR played them smoothly. Chairing agency meetings, he briskly invested the bureaucracy with direction while teaching real politique. Entertaining on a yacht, sociableness radiated. Addressing party gatherings, he was the cocky political pugilist. Motoring casually through Hyde Park, he was the country squire. At Harvard in formal wear, the dignified chief of state. FDR switched roles effortlessly. His press conferences displayed this agility. In minutes FDR cycled theatrical expression signaling amazement, worry, suspense, sympathy, gravity, playfulness, charm. Reporters laughed and delighted him. Head tilted in little bows, he was the consummate performer. These winning qualities conveyed simplicity and directness, though they veiled complexity. Surprising Ike's mid-shave in the White House bedroom, FDR had him sit on the toilet chatting while being dressed in his wheelchair. His unaffected warmth charmed, even as deeper designs were unseen. With 1936 states rising, FDR's staff reflected political shifts. How dying ended still spinning dreams of a second term. Most conservatives had departed long before. Only Moli lingered from the original right flank, increasingly uneasy as new dealers pushed left. 
Their bond frayed until an angry breakup night when FDR taunted Mola's new caution. New faces filled voids. Stanley High supplied spiritual messages to never know Reverend AIDS. Tommy Corcoran, brash escort jester turned wire puller, worked politicos with fellow legal ace Cohen. Jackson, Douglas, Lubin, New Deal's pugilistic technicians. Eleanor still advanced fresh voices and views. But singly out individuals misses the executive team rallying for FDR's re-election. For now the New Deal's benefits would be FDR's platform. Its alphabet agencies brought jobs, reforms, and hope where old ways had failed. FDR would ask for a mandate to continue the work. But opposition mounted alongside progress. Cries of dictatorship, communism, ineptitude had dogged FDR for years. A vast liberty league formed to protect free enterprise from government intrusions. Its members had money, newspapers, influence, Landon emerged from a crowded Republican field. An amiable Canton apt to drift on policy, Landon took a hard line to unify his party. Both sides girded for a fierce climax to debate between New Deal reforms versus old orthodoxies. Either FDR would gain validation to expand his vision, or a repudiation signaling retreat. Much hung in the balance. The people would referee between rival philosophies for the nation's direction. FDR prepared to state his case. He accepted the re-nominating convention's call in person, a tradition-shattering move. Breaking precedent signaled sweeping changes his leadership brought. The speech was vintage FDR. After four years of crisis management, he stepped back to articulate the deeper question, governments can err, presidents do make mistakes, but the immortal Dante tells us that divine justice weighs the sins of the cold-blooded and the sins of the warm-hearted in different scales. On such choices hang the fate of societies. Where reactionaries preached fear, FDR offered hope. The New Deal's aspirations had always outrun its concrete achievements. This hardly muted FDR's confidence. His second term would push closer to his goals. But first, the verdict. As ballots were tallied, gathered with friends and aides, FDR anxiously awaited returns. The people had rendered their judgment between parts FDR had won, decisively. The New Deal had its mandate for Act II. As 1936 began, FDR seemed energetic and hearty, while other world leaders were aging rapidly under the strains of leadership. Roosevelt loved being president and usually looked in command as he breezily handled his varied tasks. There was much for FDR to feel optimistic about as the election year unfolded. Since 1933, unemployment had dropped by 4 million, 6 million new jobs had been created, incomes and stock prices had more than doubled. The New Deal relief programs had pumped billions into projects and aid, while new initiatives like Social Security promised future stability even if their immediate economic impact was mixed. Beyond the statistics, the New Deal had aroused a nation chilled by depression. FDR's programs brought not just material gains, but a new dignity and equality to many relationships strained by economic turmoil. The very air of America is exhilarating, Roosevelt proclaimed. Still, deficiencies remained. Millions were still unemployed or untouched by government help. Many programs seemed wasteful and disorganized. But FDR aimed to spotlight the New Deal's gains, not its flaws. The period of social pioneering is only at its beginning, he told young Democrats, outlining a vision of further reforms. His campaign would vividly contrast 1933's bleakness with 1936 renewal. At first, FDR planned a low-key unity campaign to lock in New Deal gains. But the emerging Republican nominee Alf Landon, a moderately liberal Kansas governor, forced FDR's hand. Attacks also came from radical populists like Father Coughlin and Huey Long's successor Gerald L. K. Smith. FDR's popularity dipped in June. Facing mobilizing opposition, FDR had to campaign vigorously. But he delayed deciding whether to promise expanded reforms or wage a partisan fight. For now, he made the election a referendum on his leadership. It's myself, he said, people must be either for me or against me. The New Deal's solid record would be his main appeal, but if needed, he could polarize the race as a personality clash. 
FDR kept his options open, waiting to see how the political winds blew. Roosevelt dominated the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia from the White House 150 miles away. He drafted the platform, a string of praises for the New Deal, made the main decisions, and brought the affair to a dramatic climax with his acceptance speech. One platform plank reflected a major Roosevelt decision on the ticklish issue of the Supreme Court. Facing conflicting advice, Roosevelt chose a cautious approach, asserting national problems demanded national action and if legislation within the Constitution could not effectively solve them. Clarifying amendments would be sought to allow state and federal laws to regulate commerce, protect public health and safety, and safeguard economic security while maintaining the Constitution's letter and spirit. The platform pledged to continue and expand the domestic New Deal. Most revealing of Roosevelt's militants was the promise to rid our land of kidnappers, bandits and malefactors of great wealth, in the same sentence. After mangling, a period and word separated the criminals from the malefactors, but they stayed in the same paragraph. The fight over the period reflected convention dynamics. Farley kept the huge assembly in session for days, giving Philadelphia businessmen their money's worth for donating $200,000 drenching the airwaves with democratic propaganda and allowing Roosevelt to give his acceptance speech on a Saturday as for years prior. Endless speeches, songs, stunts and the ousting of all Smith Democrats who dared shout their hero's name consumed time. But one decision of potential importance was made, adoption of the majority nomination rule, moved by the son of its 1912 victim. Modified by increased representation, Southerners tokenly fought the rule change but wondered about 1940 implications. When Roosevelt's name was placed in nomination, a wild political jamboree ensued. Delegates cheered, waved banners, tooted horns in a frenzy for an hour. Roosevelt, also enthusiastic, praised the nominator for having the jury perfectly in the hollow of your hand. As 56 seconding speeches droned on, Roosevelt polished his pivotal acceptance speech. Unsure whether to appeal to all groups with sweetness and light, or make a militant partisan statement on the necessity of economic freedom, Roosevelt first sought a unifying draft from Moley, then a bare-knuckle statement from Rosenman and High. The night before his nomination, the embattled convention speeches still echoing, Roosevelt hammered out a rough draft. So rough I didn't like it, he told reporters, being a peaceful man. Both sweetness and light and something else were in it. In the Franklin Field Stadium, over 100,000 sat in rain awaiting Roosevelt. When the smiling president in a long black car reached the curtained area behind the platform, he started his slow, stiff-legged walk towards the stage. Suddenly spotting the white-bearded poet Edwin Markham, Roosevelt grabbed his outstretched hand and tumbled down. Helped up, white, shaken and angry, Roosevelt snapped, clean me up. But when the curtain opened, there stood the president, calm, erect, smiling. The crowd erupted in frenzied, ecstatic cheers. Roosevelt opened serenely, coming not just as a party leader or candidate, but a leader burdened with a grave responsibility. He thanked members of all parties for their effort against the Depression. America will not forget these years, he proclaimed. In our strength we rose together, in those days we feared fear, we have conquered fear. But not all was well in the world, Roosevelt admitted. Clouds of suspicion and ill will gathered in many places. Even in America, the rush of modern civilization raised problems that must be faced to preserve the economic freedom for which the Founding Fathers fought. A new economic despotism now threatened that freedom. The royalists of the economic order conceded that political freedom was the government's business, but maintained that economic slavery was nobody's business, Roosevelt thundered, his voice rising. These economic royalists complained of plans to overthrow America's institutions, but really complained of and losing their power. Our allegiance to American institutions requires the overthrow of this kind of power. The crowd roared its approval as Roosevelt assailed dictatorship by the overprivileged. Lowering his voice, Roosevelt said divine justice weighed the sins of the cold-blooded and the warm-hearted differently. Better a government's occasional faults while living in charity than one frozen in indifference. There is a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations much is given. Of other generations much is expected. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. 
Roosevelt looked at the ecstatic crowd as he built to his famous climax. I accept the commission you have tendered me. I join. He paused as a roar engulfed him. I join with you. I am enlisted for the duration of the war. The president raised his arm in his familiar gesture. His speech, amplified by loudspeakers, echoed through the vast stadium. As Roosevelt started his closing words, Ed Flynn, the Bronx Democratic boss, turned to a reporter standing next to him in the press section. For God's sake, what's the president's face, Flynn said hoarsely. This is a great moment. He knows it. Watch it. The president was uttering his peroration. I will say to a waiting world. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. His strong features were suffused with emotion. So, first of all, let me assert my firm belief, he lifted his head higher as if in supplication, that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Roosevelt paused dramatically, and his voice became gentle. In every dark hour of our national life, another long pause, and his voice was again strong and confident. A leadership of frankness and vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. With the final words Roosevelt raised high his left arm in triumph. A sea of faces below him seemed to surge upward as the whole stadium shook with a mighty roar. The president stood transfixed for a moment. Then Ed Flynn saw tears stream down his face. Roosevelt was weeping. The 1936 presidential election was heating up. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was seeking re-election, while Kansas Governor Alf Landon was his Republican challenger. Roosevelt was advised to run a positive, hopeful, and human-focused campaign while avoiding attacks. He initially remained bipartisan, giving speeches on various non-political topics and poking fun at both parties. Still, he did not discuss the election itself. Behind the scenes, Democratic National Committee Chairman Jim Farley faced constant Republican criticism for allegedly misusing jobs programs and funds to gain votes. This was likely an attempt to damage Roosevelt by proxy. The president continued acting above the fray. Several prominent Democratic senators and governors were not fully aligned with Roosevelt. Some progressives in Wisconsin and Minnesota, farmer labor groups, and Democratic factional disputes posed challenges for the party's unity in key states. Farley worked to smooth things over. In planning his campaign travel, Roosevelt carefully avoided states with internal Democratic conflicts. He did speak up for Senator George Norris, a progressive Republican supporting Roosevelt. Despite protests from the Democratic Senate nominee in Nebraska, Roosevelt directly endorsed Norris. Finally turning to the election in late September, Roosevelt gave a speech rejecting support from communists or other extremists, saying the New Deal saved America from unrest. He mocked the Republicans' attempts to copy his policies without details as trying to have things both ways. Traveling the Midwest in October, Roosevelt stuck to three main themes, contrasting 1936 to 1933, the role of the New Deal in ending the Depression and interdependence among Americans. He directly rebutted many Republican criticisms. His speeches expressed optimism about future reforms but offered conciliation to various groups like business. The huge enthusiastic crowds greeting Roosevelt were like nothing seen before. People chanted about how he had saved their homes and jobs. The president felt his campaign was becoming a tidal wave sweeping the Northeast. Even in small towns, throngs lined the rail tracks for miles. With the people so passionately behind him, Roosevelt's rhetoric grew more aggressive. He attacked employers scaring workers about social security. He promised better housing and condemned those seeking to divide Americans and revert back to indifference. Reaching New York City, Roosevelt whipped the crowd into a frenzy. He proclaimed that greedy business interests opposed to reform were more united against him than ever before. But he welcomed their hatred. The audience roared deafeningly in response. Riding this wave of support, Roosevelt ended October confident he would prevail over those unanimous in their hate. The people and the New Deal were on the march. The 1936 election result stunned everyone. 
Roosevelt swept the Electoral College in a historic landslide, tallying every state but two. His popular vote margin over Landon was the largest ever. The Democrats expanded their already huge majorities in Congress. Observers grasped for words it was a tidal wave, an earthquake, a blizzard. Roosevelt's political mastery was hailed. He showed an intuitive grasp of public opinion through constant information gathering. He carefully timed his moves for maximum impact. His attention to political detail kept party members happy. He followed splits within key groups to maintain allies. Several techniques stood out. Roosevelt separated Republican leaders from rank-and-file voters, attacking the former, not the latter. He forced opponents to fight on unfavorable ground. His charm and craft outmaneuvered rivals, like with John L. Lewis's donation stunt. The personal nature of the wind brought ambiguity. Roosevelt's mandate for the future was unclear, continue the New Deal, expand it, shift course. The weakened got raised concerns about democratic factional disputes. Some men won despite deserving defeat. A Labour Party was predicted by 1940. The cross-class appeal of 1932 eroded, but 1936 showed less sharp class divides than expected. Poorer voters overwhelmingly supported Roosevelt, but he retained backing across income levels. His broad support came through fuzzy positioning. Such a landslide win came at a cost, overcommitting Roosevelt. But at the time, he simply felt astonished at the scale of victory. He looked eagerly to his next term starting in January 1937, relaxed after a goodwill tour of South America. Despite the tidal wave of domestic support, worry still nagged him about the situation in Europe. 